Patrick J. Deneen is the David A. Potenziani Memorial Associate Professor of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. He holds a BA in English Literature and a PhD in Political Science from Rutgers University. Before coming to Notre Dame, he taught at Princeton University and Georgetown University. He is the author and editor of several books and numerous articles and reviews and has delivered invited lectures around the country and several foreign nations on the history of political thought, American political thought, religion and politics, and literature and politics. His books include Democratic Faith, Conserving America, question mark, Thoughts on Present Discontents, and most recently, Why Liberalism Failed. This work has been reviewed by The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times, three separate times in as many weeks, I believe. Already in its third printing and sitting atop Amazon's new releases in political philosophy, it's safe to say that Pat Professor Deneen has touched on a subject that is timely and resonates with the readership in search of innovative political answers. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Deneen. Thanks uh, very much, Patrick. Uh, Patrick didn't mention in my biography that the most important thing I've done is have Patrick in my classes at Notre Dame, so uh, he was modest in leaving that out. Uh, uh, it's really an honor uh, to be back at the University of Chicago. Uh, the, the last time I spoke here, and the only time I spoke here, I spoke on my first book, The Odyssey of Political Theory, and I think six people came. Uh, so evidently, uh, the Odyssey isn't as exciting as the failure of liberalism. I don't know why that would be the case. Uh, but um, I was here uh, before that uh, on several occasions. Uh, one worth mentioning uh, and of special uh, interest, perhaps, is uh, since this is co-sponsored by the Committee on Social Thought, is that I was a student here for a year uh, in the Committee on Social Thought from 1986 to 1987. Uh, I flunked out uh, and uh, ended up hitchhiking back east. Uh, but I was just remembering tonight as I walked down the quad that in 1986, as I was walking down the quad one day, uh, I see a, a sort of dapper figure sitting in a long overcoat and a fedora hat having his picture taken on a bench. And it turned out it was the jacket photo of Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind that I witnessed uh, being taken uh, as I passed him. Um, uh, the other occasion that I was here and actually did speak as well, it was actually in this room, was in Swift Hall in this room. Uh, it was the occasion of a, 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 what was one of a series of retrospectives on the career and work of uh, the late Jean Bethke Elstein uh, and a collection of essays uh, that arose from that, that conference and a number of other gatherings uh, is forthcoming now at Notre Dame Press, bringing our universities all the closer together. So it's a delight and a pleasure to be back in this room. And I'll finally mention that um, while I was at the University of Chicago, I took one of the classes that I took was with the late, great David Green, the classicist, uh, longtime classicist here uh, at the University of Chicago. And it was one of those great University of Chicago courses, an entire year devoted to the Odyssey and reading it slowly and carefully and preferably in Greek while David Green wore his boots uh, covered with cow manure from his farm. Uh, it was a great experience. Uh, uh, it was, in many ways, for me, the beginning of my own uh, intellectual odyssey, if I can put it that way. I wrote my first, my, wrote my dissertation, not here, at Rutgers on the Odyssey and its influence over the history of political thought, uh, and then uh, landed, uh, parlayed that into a job at Princeton, and then Georgetown, and now uh, here in the great Midwest at uh, the University of Notre Dame. So it feels, in some ways, like full circle to be back here, and I'm very honored. Uh, to have been invited. This is the first talk I'm giving since the publication of this book that has received attention that I'm not quite used to uh, and has filled a room in a way that I'm not quite used to. So I hope uh, at the very least um, that you will tell people uh, that it did not meet expectations and uh, I can speak to smaller audiences again. <laughs> so I'll begin. In a chapter of Tocqueville's Democracy in America, a chapter especially admired by many conservatives, Tocqueville explains that a democratic people will come to love equality more than liberty. They will embrace servitude even, he says, in the service of equality. And in this, he anticipates many of the worries of those in the 20th century 
that extreme forms of equality of outcome could only be achieved by the imposition of law or at the point of a gun, whether in uh, the communist nations, at the time the worry uh, that communism would take over the world, or more close to home through the auspices of the welfare state. This was the condition amusingly portrayed uh, in a story that some of you may know, and if you don't, you should. It's great for, if any of you become academics, it's a great story to tell in your classes. A story called Harrison Bergeron, written by Kurt Vonnegut, son of Indianapolis. Uh, he begins that story by telling us that following the passage of the 211th, 212th, and 213th amendments to the United States Constitution, that everyone was finally equal and that this condition was enforced by the handicapper general. Anyone who was born more beautiful would have to wear a mask, making them average. Anyone who had greater strength would wear weights, making sure they couldn't use their strength. Anyone who was more intelligent would have to wear headphones that would blare loud music uh, and disturb their thoughts so that they couldn't concentrate for any period of time. So we've done this now without a handicapper general. <laughs> But many, and even I dare say most readers of Tocqueville, o overlook his more categorical claim with which he begins this chapter. He argues or he states that liberal democracy in fact has a telos, a final point of perfection to which it will incline. He points to a condition that he describes, and I'm going to quote, as quote, the most complete form that equality can take on earth, which he states can be, and again, quote, imagined as an extreme point at which freedom and equality touch each other and intermingle. Such a condition he imagines as one of perfected equality and liberty, not to the exclusion of either. And I'll quote him again. Then at that point, at the final perfection of liberal democracy, with none differing from those like them, no one will be able to exercise a tyrannical power Men will be perfectly free because they will be entirely equal. And they will all be perfectly equal because they will be entirely free. This is the ideal to which a democratic peoples tend." End quote. A condition in which a democratic people will settle for equality without liberty or with the shrinking of liberty is thus an imperfect form of this tendency, a kind of way station on the potential and for Tocqueville the likely path of liberal democracy toward the perfection, the completion of the wedding or pairing of equality and liberty. Far from liberty and equality being opposites as so many of Tocqueville's readers take him to be saying and as our political system tends to divide, those who tend to be on the left favor equality and those on the right favoring liberty. Tocqueville himself recognized that the ultimate realization of liberal democracy was a perfected wedding of the two. Tocqueville thus implicitly recognizes the powerful tendency at the core of liberal political philosophy. Liberal theory, as I'm sure many, if not most of you know, begins with an anthropological construct in which human beings are portrayed and understood to be perfectly equal and perfectly free. One finds this for example, in chapter two of John Locke's second treatise of government, in which he writes that in a state of nature, the state in which all men are naturally in, he says, we discover human beings to be at once, I quote, a state of perfect freedom, as well as a state of equality. Locke here echoes the base condition of humans in the state of nature described in the earlier work by Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, which for all of his differences from Locke, nevertheless also envisions human beings by nature as creatures in a state of thoroughgoing liberty and complete equality. Now by liberty, both mean a condition in which one can do as one wishes without external obstacles. As described by Locke, this is the state of perfect freedom is one in which people are at liberty, and I quote, to order their actions and to dispose of their possessions and persons as they see fit, within the bounds of nature, the law of nature, without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. So perfect liberty to act as one wishes. Locke here echoes Hobbes's understanding of liberty. 
which, had been, which he had defined as the absence of external impediments. I quote from Hobbes. By equality, what is meant is a condition in which any hierarchy or authority is absent, political or otherwise. In Locke's formulation, creatures of the same species and rank should also be equal to each, uh, to each one amongst another without subordination or subjection, equal liberty, without anyone claiming some kind of natural form of authority. The portrait then of natural man that emerges from Locke's state of nature scenario is a creature defined by nearly thoroughgoing freedom to act as he or she wishes and not subject to the authority of any particular person or people. Now the point of this construct, which is you know, many manifold, uh, uh, has many different objects, of course, uh, and has been interpreted in many different ways, was at least in significant part to contrast this idea of the natural condition of human beings with the condition in which most people actually found themselves. People are not born into conditions of such radical equal freedom, free from the authority of persons or the various ways in which our liberty can be constrained. In the first instance, as every child around the age of four years old knows, you're born to particular people who are unfair. <laughs> they who constitute the first arbitrary authority over one limiting one's liberty to dispose of our possessions and our persons as we wish. I can't even use my cell phone when I want to. They and the broader society into which we are born introduce us into a world of unchosen limits, including what language we will speak and as a result we will learn to think in. That's a big limitation. All of the thoughts you won't have because we speak this weird language of English. The first people that we will come to know and who will shape our personalities for better and for ill. The kind of society we will be raised in and shaped by. The customs and the traditions we will adopt. For many, the religion into which they will be raised and encouraged to believe to be the true religion to the exclusion of any other religion. Or if you're from one of those progressive households, no religion which is also believed to be the true belief. Locke presents a version or a vision of human nature at odds with much of human experience, certainly in his time and arguably, at least to some extent, our own. As my colleague, I guess I could say, although I've never met him, Alistair McIntyre suggests, our actual condition is that of dependent, rational animals. And the condition especially of being dependent constitutes more of our lifespans than the condition of independence. Think of all of you who are going to be living in your parents' basements. Which leads to the suggestion by McIntyre that social contract theory is a construct populated by people living perpetually in their late 20s. I think that's an overestimation of when we experience independence. Or as the great French political theorist Bertrand de Juvenel waggishly observed, and I quote, social contract theories are the views of childless men who have forgotten their own childhood. <laughs> Yet if social contract theory seems premised on an unreal and unrealistic view of human origins, I want to suggest that its true aim was never to describe an actual conditions of what human beings were at some point in time, some historical moment, but rather a vision of what they were to become. While seeming to offer an abstract standard of nature by which to measure and evaluate potential illiberal, unchosen arrangements within human society, its deeper ambition was an imagining not of social and political origins, but a vision of human telos made possible by a reordering of politics and society, of economy, of family, of education, of technology, of science, and so forth. Everything we might think of as constituting society. Liberal philosophy articulated an aim and goal for liberal politics and liberal society. The creation, now through artifice, of the human creature envisioned in the state of nature, that condition of equal freedom. The irony was that this purported natural creature was then and is now nowhere to be found in nature, but as Tocqueville understood, could be brought ever more fully into being in an ever more realized, or as he puts it, perfected 
liberal polity and liberal society. Natural man could only be brought more fully into being in and through society. Such a creature would not be the result of nature, but an extensive and ultimately world-straddling and world-transforming liberal order that would arise and would expand in its power and its scope in order to realize such a creature. Natural man, so-called, would be the result of a titanic architecture combining political, economic, social, technological, and educational forms all designed to realize this free and equal human being. The liberal human being would be the creation, then, of a comprehensive order that would leave, in fact, little choice but to become the infinitely choosing creature of liberal imagining. The deepest irony we confront as we witness the maturation coming of age, in some ways the coming closer to perfection of liberalism, is a world increasingly populated by such humans. But the irony is that the very tools that would be needed to bring these natural creatures into existence would simultaneously come to be experienced as shackles and as unleashing forces and processes that were no longer under our control. An expansive state a global market would be needed to foster the conditions that would make possible the creation of this autonomous, free, and equal individual. The liberal state and its market would exist especially to liberate individuals from arbitrary and unchosen forms of life, especially that horizon-shaping existence of culture as the vessel of unchosen identities. In place of culture, liberal orders instead foster a pervasive anti-culture, a universal and homogenous condition of a kind of normlessness that is the opposite of culture in every respect. It is placeless, existing in a temporal vacuum, neither embedded in a past or connected to a future. It is dislocated from the natural rhythms of life and the world, and in some ways, you could say it's nothing other than a highly contrived version, a civilized form of the state of nature itself. It is a creation especially of the global market, including prepackaged and consumer-tested commodification of liberal equal equality. And if you doubt me, think of the mottos that rule our age. Just do it. YOLO. Or a slogan that I see every time I pass through the Notre Dame bookstore, I will what I want. Notre Dame, go oh, Irish. The creation and expansion of an anti-culture is the ground condition for the creation of the liberated human being. Where origins once presented bounds on self-creation, parents, family, place, culture, tradition, religion, a flattening of the globe would usher in the possibility, at least for some, of continual ongoing self-fashioning. Those of you familiar with the work the great treatise On Liberty by John Stuart Mill captures this in many of his statements of living in a world in which, in his view, few people could consider alternative options for how they would live their life because, as he stated, everywhere the tyranny of custom holds sway. Life under such terms, he argued, is defined by the unreflective absence of choice of the kind of life we will lead. He called for the reordering not only of the political world, but of the social world as well, the opinions that would be held by others, the freedom to experiment, what he called experiments in living, which he took to be the engine of material and moral progress. The claims of culture, of custom, and tradition would have to recede, would have to be increasingly regarded as unjust limitations on free choice and self-invention. Ironically, then, the world created for the benefit of those inclined toward and benefiting from such experiments in living, that world would become the unchosen norm for all people. We would switch one unchosen norm for another one. We would all live in an anti-culture. Now, debates in our current politics revolve over what mechanism best advances this anti-culture and the equal liberty it permits. The dissolution of existing cultures, the identities and so forth, depends upon the creation of depersonalized and abstract media in which interactions can take place 
without any corresponding interpersonal obligation or indebtedness. And like the state of nature, it emulates placelessness, historyless, historylessness, and a distance from the natural order. By, by impersonal uh, media, I, I mean the following. I give you the following example. Uh, certain Amish orders prohibit uh, the purchase of insurance uh, among its adherents. And the reason for this is not that they want you to drive your horse and buggy without insurance. The reason is that it's believed by this order of the Amish that if something bad happens to you, if your house burns down, if a parent dies, uh, if, uh, uh, if there's theft, which probably doesn't happen a lot, uh, that it's the response, direct responsibility of the people in that community to make you whole. It's not the, uh, it's not the uh, reliance upon the impersonal me mechanism of what we have, which is everyone throws some money into a pool and then you make a claim upon that money. You never have to actually know who else is paying the money into that pool. We treasure and value the impersonality. This is a core, we could say a core basis of our society. The fact we never have to actually ask anyone directly and create a personal obligation and require in some ways to owe personal gratitude and then to be bound in some ways to return that in the form of a kind of debt. The great competition in the liberal order comes to be defined by the contest over which impersonal mechanism best creates and protects our equal liberty. Is it the market? Or is it the state? Think about the great debate taking place right now about insurance, health insurance. Is it the market? Is it the state? How many of you are going to get up on the rampart and say, kids should take care of their parents when they get old? It's not a big part of our society. It doesn't matter if you're a liberal or conservative. One side holds that a largely unregulated marketplace is the best medium for collecting billions of individual choices without imposing a preconceived plan for particular social outcomes. The market becomes a mechanism of impersonal cooperation. It's described by Hannah Arendt, for example. The other side holds that the state is the more social and just mechanism, in significant part because the market generates unequal realization of equal liberty. Not everyone is equally free. The state becomes the best mechanism of impersonal sociability. But while we fight titanic battles over which mechanism is more essential, and in the end, both sides support both, really. It's just which one's going to hold sway. In reality, both grow continuously and simultaneously, advancing both economic and social and political liberty through the expansion of a single, universal, and homogenous anti-culture. We fought these battles for decades, and notice that they both grow. The result is a political and economic system that trumpets liberty, but which inescapably creates, as a result, conditions of felt powerlessness, fragmentation, mistrust, and resentment. The liberated individual comes to despise the creature of its making and the source, the perceived source of its powerlessness. Think of the great social movements, at least of recent years. If it's the state, then we see the Tea Party rising up and protesting their powerlessness before the state. Or if it's Occupy Wall Street, we see those people rising up and saying, no, it's the market, the unrestrained market is our oppressor. The tools of our liberation cease to be governable and become instead perceived as independent forces in which disempowered individuals must submit, whether the depersonalized public bureaucracy or the depersonalized global market forces. And if you doubt me, start paying attention to all the times you'll come across statements by economists, by political scientists, by experts of any, any stripe who will tell you X is inevitable. Automation is inevitable. The global market is inevitable. The growth of the bureaucracy is inevitable. This is the condition of our freedom. You have a choice to submit, or if you don't submit, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Much of our common response to liberalism's triumph today is a celebration of our completed liberty. But it takes 
often the form of discussions and debates over the ways in which we can lessen the unease accompanying our powerlessness and dislocation as we submit terms of surrender to those ungovernable forces in politics and economics. My most recent encounter with this argument, I was reading my signing in class uh, this coming week, uh, the book uh, Homo Deus by Noah, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, some of you might be familiar with this book, who argues that we are in the process of transforming our very nature, uh, and in particular, transforming ourselves into what we can understand or what an earlier age would have understood to be God. P creatures that completely control nature, that have overcome mortality, uh, that have the ability to manipulate their environment without limit. That, and then he, in the latter part of this chapter, argues that there is no stopping this. This is inevitable. And those who wish to stop it are simply trying to stop a force uh, that cannot be slowed. Thus, the tools of our liberation are increasingly experienced as uncontrollable entities that now govern the humans who made them. How long do, how long do we go? About an hour. So, okay. I have a section which I want to talk about these in, in, in some detail. I'll, just, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll try to summarize a couple, a couple sections rather than uh, talk for another hour or so. Let me, let me at least touch on, in, in some detail, three ways in which these main tools of liberalism at once quite consciously have shaped us purposefully and intentionally into the individu individuals envisioned in the state of nature, those creatures who enjoy equal liberty but through their very success, render us powerless through the very achievement of our liberation. And thus lead today, it seems to me, to a crisis of legitimacy of the liberal order itself, those people feeling powerless in the face of these forces. This paradox isn't just accidental, but built into the very structure that is erected to serve the end of the liberation of the equal and free individual. To start close to home, consider our attachment to the central government, the federal government. I would say many of our contemporary political woes dividing not only our nation, but I have line colleagues and faculty lounges, and then I realize there's no division among colleagues and faculty lounges, but maybe a few. Friends in bars, and even, yes, at Thanksgiving over the dinner table among family that these divisions arise in considerable part because of our complete identification with national political alignments. I'll give you one example of this. Every semester in a class I'm teaching, I assign students a two-page paper in which I ask them to write a political autobiography. How did you come to have the political beliefs that you have? I've done this now for probably 15 years. It's a fascinating collection of reflections on how young people come to have their uh, political identities. It's either I, I have my, my parents' political identity because I believe what they believe, or I have my political identity because I disagree completely with my parents. <laughs> That's sort of where things end up. I had one paper, probably out of 300 or more papers that I've assigned over the years, one paper that didn't describe the political alignments according to the national issues. This young person wrote, I, my political identity was formed when my town prevented Walmart from moving in. I said, man, that is an interesting person. I want to get to know you. The only one. Every single student defines their politics in relationship to the great national issues of our day. What do I think about the economy? What do I think about the social issues and so forth? While this identification today seems natural and inevitable, this was the main topic of intense debate at the time of the ratification of our Constitution. Opponents to the Constitution, the people we've sort of forgotten, they are called anti-federalists, the worst name ever for a political organization. A, never have the word anti in front of your name in politics, and B, they were federalists. <laughs> they argued early on that the Constitution's basic and fundamental design aimed at consolidation. They said it was going to consolidate. Every time there was a great political controversy, power would accrue to the center, and it was designed to do that. They believed over time that the constitutional order would eviscerate local forms 
and local practices of self-rule, the kinds that Tocqueville sees when he comes to America in the 1830s, and that over time we would come to have far more distant national rule. This would empower us. This would allow us to be freer as the federal government created a national economic system, it created the powers to perpetrate and, and advance American power abroad, right? securing economic travel lanes, supply lanes, and so forth, that we would come to identify our liberty with the federal government because it could ensure our experience of equal liberty. But what we would in some ways come to see as the absence of a form of liberty would be that form of democratic self-governance, which was the practice at the time and which the anti-federalists feared would be eviscerated. What's more, if you read the Federalist Papers, which I assign often, and you can read a summary of this in my book, available for sale, the authors of the Federalist admit that this is their object. They're quite frank that this is their object. To summarize in brief an argument that's made across several of the papers in the Federalist Papers, so you really have to pay attention to get this. Sort of the argument is snuck in. Hamilton, you know, the guy in the musical, and Madison, both recognize that local affections tend to dominate human affairs. We tend to prefer what's our own. That this is a natural thing. They mean this in some ways to say, you and I Federalists don't worry because the local will always be more important. But then each of them in different papers say, unless, unless, the central government is better administered than the local governments. And then what does Madison say in Federalist 17? All of the best and brightest minds of the country are going to want to go work in Washington because that's where the action is. And those of you who are professors, maybe those of you who are students, think about where your students go when they graduate or think about where you might go when you graduate. They're not knocking down the door in Indianapolis at Notre Dame. They're all ending up in Washington. Ma Hamilton was exactly right. If you're interested in commerce, I'll quote him, commerce, finance, war, and international affairs, this is the object that charmed the minds of a certain type, Hamilton states. This is what will attract men of ambition and power and competence. The Federals acknowledge that the force of the principle of local allegiance and local governance would be destroyed, and I'm quoting, destroyed by a much better administration of the center. That we will come to identify our liberty with a powerful central state. And both of the Federalists in different parts of the Federalist Papers acknowledge that this will be the outcome. There can be little doubt then who was right concerning where our intention would be focused. Publius, the Federalist, understood that local devotions could ultimately be overcome by the power of the state to increase the experience of equal liberty experienced by individuals. To be a democratic citizen entitled one increasingly, or, or oriented one to a definition of democracy defined by our equal liberty, not by our civic capacity to participate and exercise control over the affairs of government. Now, while it's true that the contemporary right and the contemporary political left oppose aspects of this equal liberty of individualism, the left disapproving of economic individualism, and the right seeking to reign in forms of expressive or personal individualism, especially in sexual realm, what we see is that, in fact, the progressives have had little success in reigning in the expansion of the private realm devoted to the acquisition of property and economic power. And conservatives have had equally little success in thwarting the expansion of individual expressivism, right? especially thwarting the advance of the sexual revolution. And if anyone would wish to know why the Republicans have failed to make the federal gov government smaller or devolve power back to the states in significant ways as they've been promising to do since way back in the 1980s, we should recognize that such a reversal would rub against the grain of the regime. It was designed so that power would accumulate at the center, and especially designed to attract the most ambitious, 
who would endeavor by dint of constitutional ambitiousness to ensure that power in the center would redound to the, uh, to the advance of this experience of individual liberty. Let me turn to the second of these examples that I would offer. Liberal markets are the main tool of liberal politics, affecting the same end of disembedding individuals from cultures and places and history and nature. And I would point you, if you're interested, and again, I talk about this for a bit in the book, that few works have made this intentional aim of our form of market clearer than the historian and sociologist Karl Polanyi in his great study, the, the Great Transformation, a book I recommend strongly to anyone interested in this subject. Polanyi explored and described how economic arrangements in early modernity sought to disembed particular cultural and religious forms and arrangements that governed markets that were embedded in markets. If you want an example of this, in book five of Aristotle's politics, he has this brief line in which he says, of course in the market a statue of the graces preside. Why? What's grace? Charis in the Greek? It's gift, that which is freely given. Why does the grace preside in the market? Because the market is a place of exchange which includes gift. Something Pope Benedict sought to remind us of. That a real market isn't just the effort always to extract something more for my ends and my purposes, as Adam Smith was to describe it. The, place, the, the role of a market, by this understanding, is a place where community is formed. I mean, if you have a really good farmer's market like we have in South Bend, you know this, where there is gift. Polanyi described then how ec economic exchange so ordered placed a priority on in, in this older sense, placed a priority on the main ends of social, political, and religious life, the sustenance of community, and the flourishing of families within that order. And we see this again in the, in the Greek derivation of the word economics, oikos nomos, the law of the household. Economics is designed to sustain homes and families. The understanding of an economy based upon an accumulation of calculations by self-maximizing individuals was not, by these understandings, properly speaking, a market. The market was literally a place, the agora. It was understood to be a physical space within a social order, not an autonomous theoretical space that's nowhere. Right? Think how we talk today. We have governments or polities, but we only have one market. Everything is within the market and contained within the market. Polanyi in his book describes how replacement of this older economy required a deliberate and often violent reshaping of local economies, most often by elite economic and state actors disrupting and displacing traditional communities and practices. The individuation of people required not only the separation of markets from social and religious contexts, but people's accept acceptance of the view that their labor and its products were nothing more than the commodities that were subject solely to price mechanisms. This was a transformative way of considering people and nature alike in newly utilitarian and individualistic terms. As Polanyi pithily describes this transformation, and I'm gonna anger every libertarian in the audience, quote, laissez-faire was planned. This process has been repeated countless times in our history of, of modern political economy. And this, you won't find this in any economics textbook, which always describes the abstract human being in the state of nature, basically, utility, utility maximizing individual chooser. This, this existed in the efforts to eradicate the medieval guilds. One saw it in the enclosure movement in early modernity, in the state suppression of Luddites, who were trying to keep their jobs against the introduction of automation, early automation, in state support for owners over organized labor, in government efforts to empty the nation's farmland by replacement with mechanized industrial farming, something that one of my favorite authors, Wendell Berry, has written a lot about. It was, uh, it was and continues to be in many ways uh, at the heart of the effort to globalize our economic system, again, through the mechanism of elite actors seeking to advance uh, a movement of economy that always moves in one direction. The state's role then in enforcing the existence of a national market 
has been, uh, among other things, enfor uh, enforced by various efforts to roll back various state-based environmental standards, right, local environmental standards. This was the activity most ardently embraced by those, um, by those uh, uh, Republican administrations that were otherwise strident defenders of states' rights. From the dawn of modernity to contemporary headlines, the proponents and heirs of classical liberalism, those we call today conservative, have offered frequent defenses of traditional values, while at the same time its leadership class has supported you more or less unanimously, although there's interesting cracks right now, supporting the main instrument of practical individuation in the modern world, at least in our economy, the global marketplace. Lastly, the liberal goal of expanding liber equal liberty of individuals was advanced by the transformation of the human understanding of nature from one in which human culture develops in sympathetic relationship with nature with considerable deference to that order to one in which nature comes to be perceived at once as an object for our use and an obstacle to our equal liberty. The imperative to overcome culture as part of the project of mastering nature was expressed among others by one of the great heroes of progressive liberalism, John Dewey. You might think of him only as the guy with the Dewey Decimal System, not that anybody knows what that is anymore. In his discussion of education, which he discussed often, he argued in his book, Democracy and Education, that a main, a main aim, if not the main aim of education, was the expansion, the ever greater expansion of active uh, control of one's environment. This was the test of whether education was successful. He called this growth and activity, the words he frequently used, and that through human power and growth and activity, our ability to do as we wished in the world would be expanded. But above all, he argued, this rested especially on the active control of nature, and hence required, again, the conscious and purposive displacement of what he regarded as backward traditional beliefs and cultural forms and practices that reflected backward and limiting regard for the past and a deferential relationship to the natural world. In one passage, he described the two main approaches that, that humans could have in their relationship toward nature. The one he called, this is kind of a giveaway here, the one he called civilized, and the other he called savage. Guess which one's better? The savage tribe, he wrote, manages to live, he gives an example of a desert, manages to live in a desert merely by adapting itself to the natural limits of, its, of that environment, living within the means of what that environment offers. Thus, he writes, and I quote, its adaptation involves a maximum of accepting, tolerating, putting up with things as they are, a maximum of passive acquiescence, and a minimum of active control, of subjection to use, end quote. A civilized people, by contrast, he argues, living in the same desert also adapts, but, and I quote, it introduces irrigation. It searches the world for plants and animals that will flourish under such conditions. It improves by careful selection those which are growing there. As a consequence, the wilderness blossoms as a rose. The savage is merely habituated. The civilized man has habits which transform the environment, he writes. Dewey traced these ideas back to Francis Bacon, whom he considered to be the most important thinker in the history of philosophy. This is in his book, The Reconstruction in Philosophy. In that book, he wrote, Bacon teaches us that scientific laws, I'm quoting, scientific laws do not lie on the surface of nature. They are hidden and must be wrested from nature by an active technique, I'm sorry, active and elaborate technique of inquiry. The scientist, he goes on, must, and I quote again, must force the apparent facts of nature into forms different than those in which they familiarly present themselves and thus make them tell the truth about themselves as torture may compel an unwilling witness to reveal what he has been concealing. Now many of today's liberals recoil at such a statement, bald expression of hubris about torturing nature, but it seems to me rather than question Dewey's effort to eliminate culture toward the end of dominating nature, 
that liberals of all stripes are inclined to accept at some level the liberal belief in the human separateness from nature and to insist on its conquest by humanity, whether it's the technological control of the natural world, what was it, um, drill, baby, drill, Technical, conservative liberals, or the technological control of the human body, particularly through the control of reproduction and the mastery of the genetic code, such as Harari's book that we will make ourselves into human gods. Antipathy to culture as, as a deep relationship with nature that defines, includes, and limits human nature remains a core feature of the liberal project, whether on our purported left or right. Today, then, these tools of our liberation have now made us their subjects. Advanced liberal democracies are democracy in name only, with citizens expressing soaring levels of disapproval of their governments as purportedly their own entities that they control, but experienced largely as separate from the citizenry. The growth of a government military industrial complex aimed at the liberation of humans has rendered them subject to forces beyond their control. So too, their experience of the market as an expanding field no longer subject to any political control is met now with nationalist demands for the reinstitution of national markets. And while political leaders today willingly ride this wave of populist discontent, or at least make the appearance of doing so, Angela Merkel, the market appears to read the situation as one requiring little real worry, as my stock market, my retirement portfolio tells me. And lastly, as the Kentucky author Wendell Berry has observed, if indeed we are at war with nature, then nature is winning and was always going to win. Whether responding to our onslaughts, to its torture, with either a destabilized climate born of our love affair with the freedom afforded by the internal combustion engine, or the precipitous decline of birth rates born of our love affair from, well, love affairs, <laughs> Nature is letting us know that every war has collateral damage. This then is a brief, I wish you wish briefer, summary of my basic thesis that liberalism is failing because liberalism has succeeded. By becoming more fully itself, as Tocqueville suggested it would, we see the crisis of the liberal order not because it has failed to live up to its aims, but because it has increasingly achieved what it set out to do. The liberal reordering of our life world successfully brought into being what was merely theoretical in its imaginary state of nature, shaping a world in which the theory of natural human individualism becomes ever more a reality, now secured through this vast architecture of law, politics, economics, technology, society, and yes, education that now stresses STEM over the liberal arts. Ah, humbug. Under liberalism, human beings increasingly live in a condition of equal liberty in which the threatened anarchy of our purportedly natural condition is controlled, observed, quantified, measured, uh, increasingly subject to automation through the imposition of laws, but also an increasingly uh, a state that increasingly observes our every activities, and not just a state, but a market as well, of course. Amazon is always watching and listening. Alexa is here. With humanity liberated from constitutive communities, leaving us with the freedom of loose connections, choosing who we are, who we'll be with, where we'll be, where, if we'll be anywhere, who we'll marry, who we'll love, who we won't marry, who we won't love, what I am, what my identity is today. With nature harnessed and controlled, the constructed sphere of equal liberty expands seemingly without limit and yet we experience this victory with at least the cele celebration of a kind of Pyrrhic form as a kind of contraction of liberty. We are confronted at least with the very real possibility that we have reached the end of liberalism, perhaps its telos, if not its cessation, raising as more than a question for political theorists whether we must contemplate the prospects of liberty after liberalism. Thank you very much.
Um, no, in fact, I'm, of course, I'm, I'm reading that passage in this, uh, in this chapter, which I, again, I think is often deeply misinterpreted or at least misunderstood or insufficiently understood as Tocqueville's way of recognizing that while he himself is not a social contract theorist, but recognizing that the kind of creature that liberal democracy seeks to bring into being, it turns out, is the creature described in the state of nature theory. Now, he doesn't say that explicitly. I'm, I'm inferring that, but I think I'm right. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, that, that he's describing exactly in exact terms the marriage of equality and liberty. It's exactly uh, uh, the description of the state of nature. Uh, I think maybe one of the best descriptions of Tocqueville, at least in terms of his relationship to liberalism, is this tr truer of the French tradition uh, as, in general, Montesquieu, Constant, um, Rousseau, very strange liberal. Uh, that Tocqueville is a kind of tortured liberal if he's a liberal. Obviously, he cares about liberty. Uh, and if by, by liberalism we mean people who care about liberty, then Tocqueville clearly cares about liberty. But I think he's deeply concerned, and I take it that the deepest theme of democracy in America is his concern that the understanding of liberty that animates modern liberal philosophy will ultimately undermine liberty, will ultimately undermine democracy. Yes, I'm just cribbing Tocqueville. This is entirely ripped off from Tocqueville. It's trying to update some things that Tocqueville writes about. The greatest paradox in Tocqueville's argument is that democracy in America, this title of this book, is really a misnomer. It's really mistitled. He talks about several democracies in America, but the two I would point to is he talks about democracy in America as he witnesses uh, in the townships in the 1830s, as he witnesses it practiced. And I'm from one of these New England towns, Windsor, Connecticut, shout out, uh, which still has town hall meetings, real town hall meetings, not the ones like on CNN, uh, and uh, which, uh, at least when I lived there, when I grew up there, was very much defined by this kind of sort of civic ethos, um, uh, just uh, nostalgic stories about friends, parents who ran the businesses in town. And this is the kind of market I understand. The money in the town kind of stayed in the town. And it would go into not just the business, but it would go into the little league teams that we had. And it would go into uh, the town parades that we would name the young woman who would win the Shad Derby contest. Yes, we had Shad Derby contest, the most fishy looking young woman, uh, when the returning of the shad came. This was, the, what Tocqueville witnessed in the 1830s was democracy, in which he said it was the active participation of, of, of an entire community in the governance of itself. And he said the remarkable thing was that the focus of people's lives was really, he said if you were to take away the ability to participate in politics, it would be as if you took away half their lives, he states. Amazing thing to state today. But the most important thing he describes is not necessarily what was accomplished, the end that was achieved, but the transformation that this has on the individuals who participate in political life. He, he described this kind of democracy as having a changing effect on people, writing that in, in and through such activity, the heart is enlarged. You end up elsewhere than where you began. So it wasn't just an expression of interest where you go into a voting booth and say, this is my interest. It was something that changed you as a result of interaction and dialogue. And I think all of you know what that's like, I hope. Then he describes another democracy at the very end of democracy in America. And this democracy is a democracy of free and equal individuals. This is the democracy that's achieved after all of the tendencies that I've been describing, that he's describing, uh, what he describes, among other things, as the creation of individualism in America. This is the democracy, in a sense, at the end of democracy. And he says, I don't know how to describe it because I don't have a word for it, but the only way I can describe it is as a form of uh, democratic despotism. It's a despotism of completely liberated, it's a, it's a condition of completely liberated individuals who no longer have any connection to each other. They make no claims on each other. They live lives of thoroughgoing freedom and equality, but when trouble happens, when something bad happens, they have nowhere to turn except to the state. And he says at that point, the state steps in and gladly assists us. He says in the, eight, in the ancient times, people worried about tyranny as something that would be imposed upon people. He says democracy will end with a despotism in, in which people will invite it, which they will invite it as a condition, as, a, as assuaging their condition. So I. I think Tocqueville, I would describe him as a tortured 
liberal, someone who sees the underlying logic within liberal democracies, and as a last, as a last point, who argues that for liberalism, for this form of liberalism, liberal democracy to survive, it has to be willing in some ways to accept in its midst things that it may not like, it may consider to be illiberal. Uh, it may have to, for example, accept um, or even embrace uh, um, family life. He says women will not be equal in the family. You may have to embrace uh, uh, um, parts of society that are still ordered on a more aristocratic form. Believe it or not, he says lawyers uh, will be the uh, aristocratic segment of the society because they will be the form of memory uh, of a deep history. I wish he'd written a chapter on education because I think what he would have said is that universities can be that kind of make weight because they can be places where memory is preserved and where history and transmission takes place. I'm always struck when I'm back at the University of Chicago because you can see the transformation, literally, of how we come to define liberty in some ways. I walked by, I think I walked by Harper Library back here, right? It's where I always studied. Magnificently beautiful, I love studying there. And then I walked past the spaceship that landed over <laughs> across campus. And the striking thing is, as I was looking through your library, I noticed there are no books there. Uh, I guess they're underground. Make it hard for the spaceship to take off. Uh, but um, that um, the transformation of the universities, it really is in keeping with Dewey's argument, it has to become a place that, in some ways, displaces the older liberal arts and replaces it especially with the STEM disciplines, with that which will allow us to enact our liberty through our control of nature and our control of our circumstance. So I think Tocqueville would say, hold on to those things as long as you can. Uh, but you may not be able to. Anyway, so that was a long answer to a really good question. Uh, you know, I think what you describe in the case of Canada is basically illiberal liberalism. I, I would distinguish these two things. Uh, that liberalism, in order to advance itself increasingly in society, seeks to advance the securing for the lives of equal and, in, equal and free individuals, increasingly where it bumps up against the most sort of recalcitrant parts of society. And where are those going to be? Family, marriage, children, biology. When it bumps it into those really hard nuts to crack, it's going to increasingly do, through, do so through illiberal means. And this is where we begin to see real state activism uh, sort of enforcing you, right, in, to in Rousseau's terms, forcing you to be free. Right? The HHS mandate perhaps is a good example of this. You must provide birth control. Right? It's not a matter of choice. Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not a purchase you make or you don't make. Uh, at Notre Dame, we first fought this, and then we didn't fight it. It's an interesting decision. But that you, you must provide this because this is the condition of what it is to be a free and equal individual, that our biology shouldn't limit us in our freedom and our equality. So I think you see on the one hand expressions of illiberal liberalism, and I think that's pretty rampant, especially in college campuses and left-wing governments today. And of course you also see now increasingly expressions of illiberal illiberalism in, in other parts of the world. And I would say there's a direct relationship between the two. Right? What's, what's going on in Eastern Europe with Poland and with Hungary, among other places? Many of these reactions are reactions against what they see as the heavy hand of Europe and the European Union, forcing them in some ways to say, you will conform to what we think are the norms uh, and conditions of liberal democracy. Not, not that you have a choice in this, you will, you will do so. And so I... So part of what I'm hoping to do in this book is sort of to awaken both sides and say, you're creating the worst monster of your imagination by continuing on this path. Those of you who don't like Donald Trump, um, you might be complicit. You might have something to do with that. I know it's not popular to say that. Uh, but uh, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but I'm also not ready simply to say everyone in the world or everyone in America who voted him was simply a racist. I'm sure there were some. 
but I think there were many who simply said, we are not doing well under this system in which a lot of people are doing, or at least some people are doing very well. And I know I moved from Washington, D.C. to South Bend, Indiana, so I know what I've seen. There are some people doing extraordinarily well, and it doesn't matter if they're left or right. Now, the wonderful thing about living in D.C., it really doesn't matter if you're left and right, because you all go to the same great restaurants. <laughs> And when you live in South Bend, it doesn't matter if you're left and right because there are no good restaurants. <laughs> so, I, so part of my book is to say, look, you know, we have to stop thinking that the other side is completely to blame for everything that's wrong in the world. And if we don't want the worst and most virulent forms of illiberal illiberalism to manifest themselves in our politics, then illiberal liberalism uh, needs to take a look in the mirror. Be my response. I hope that is not quite as unpopular as what you just said. <laughs>
but we're very bad at subtraction. We're very bad at assessing the costs, or we tend to view the costs as externalized. Right? Uh, we talk a lot about global warming, for example. People often debate over it, but if you think it's true, then all, every penny that we're needing to spend either on cleanup after very violent new storms, or if we have to you know, create new seawalls or move entire populations, we will never measure that against this, this great gain. We'll actually put that, we'll tally that as a GDP. We'll tally that as a gain. But we'll never subtract it. Um, so I, I suppose my, my effort is, simply, is not to say simply everything's terrible and dark, although I often think that, but we, we need to learn to subtract. And, and a hard part of that is um, to realize what we accept as, um, in some ways, the water in which we swim in our fishbowl uh, may be poisoned, uh, unbeknownst to us. It may have low, low oxygen levels, uh, and we may need a kind of uh, uh, an insertion of, uh, of some oxygen in our tank. Yeah, uh, so uh, one, of the, one of the questions I'll often get, I've been doing a lot of radio interviews, uh, uh, 6 a.m. this morning with Australia. Australians are worried about liberalism, apparently. Uh, um, is, well, okay, what's your, what's your solution? You know, what, are you going, what do you want to do about it? And in the first place, I want to say I want to sell my book. So, uh, uh, no. I, uh, no, in the first place, I think we need to diagnose our condition. Um, and I want to offer my argument as a, what I hope is a deeper diagnosis of uh, what I think is often a very superficial analysis of our political condition. I can't say, guarantee that I'm right, but I hope I'm at least right enough that we can somewhat change the conversation and how we think of our condition. Uh, but when I'm asked what I would do about it, I actually do find myself thinking a lot about Belloc and Chesterton. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Chester Belloc, as they came to be known, uh, had a, both Catholic thinkers who developed a view of the economy that I think moves in the direction of moving beyond this kind of left-right view that it's either the state or the market. And what, what they argued, and again, it would be very interesting to see if you know, inventive people who know more about economics than I do could really begin to think hard about this. What they argued is that capitalism and statism grow together. I mean, again, it's not an original thesis with me. And they grow together because the state wants to capture and benefit from very large enterprises. And very large enterprises want to capture the state. They want to capture the regulatory system. They want to capture benefits, right? what we think of today as uh, crony capitalism, rent seeking. They're absolutely right about this. They say that, I mean, they argue, as we all know, uh, from Economics 101, that capitalism moves inexorably in the direction of monopoly. That, that there will be consolidation. Just as you could say in politics, we move in the direction of monopoly. Power seeks to accrue to the center. And so the irony is that if you want to have a society of widespread ownership of property, if you're a capitalist, you should want widespread ownership of, cap of, of capital or of property. I mean, capitalist should really be anti-monopolist. Shouldn't want Amazon to own everything. I w I'm willing to bet you money, am I being recorded? I'm willing to bet you money that Amazon's gonna settle in Washington, D.C. It would be the most brilliant move ever. Turn it into Amazon's company town and they will never be touched politically, never, never. It would be, it would be the obvious thing to do. Plus you have that bright, brilliant workforce of all my students going there. So, uh, Chesterton argues if you want limited government, you have to have a strong government that will break up monopolies. Uh, and you have to, in some ways, try to ensure a market. It's not, it's not spontaneous order. A market is organized by a polity. You have to strive to organize a market that will seek, as its end, widespread ownership of actual workable property. Now, when he's writing, he's thinking of farming small business ownership, small uh, store owners and the like. That might not be our situation today, although it wouldn't be bad if more of us farmed. Uh, but uh, our situation might be one in which we have more ownership of the companies in which we work. 
you know, employee stock ownership plans. I'm not an economist, and I don't know a lot about this, but um, I'll tell you the following story, though. My, my father-in-law is a, is a this is going to sound bad, he's a butcher. Yeah, he's a butcher. No, really, he's a, he's a, he's, he's German, and he's a butcher. Uh, and uh, he, he does everything himself, from, from pig to sausage. Uh, he creates the most amazing food. Uh, and he can tell you everything about his business because it's who he is. He is so proud of what he does. He controls every aspect of production. He knows his workers. And if, if you have any question about any aspect of his business, he knows it. And when he comes to visit us in the United States, he's always shocked because he goes into a store, goes into a supermarket, and if he asks somebody, German, his English isn't great, but if he asks somebody something, more times than not, the work will say, I, I don't know. I don't know. Let me, let me go find a manager. And the manager doesn't know. And why is that? Because they're all hourly workers. They have no, no skin in the game. They know they'll be working in another business in another six months. So I think if we want a society in which we care about the things we produce, where they come from, and where they go to, then an ownership society is one it seems that we should want. And so I guess if I'm asked, what do I think practically could be done to begin a move away from this kind of, this form of political and economic consolidation that apparently serves our equal liberty, well, one way would be an, an ownership society. But again, that means we'd have to be more likely than not uh, to develop care for particular things and places and activities. And that's, that would be, for some people, a burden and a responsibility. So be it. I was actually in this room uh, when, uh, uh, for the Jean Beth Elston uh, Love Fest, uh, and no, it was really a great conversation. Uh, but uh, Francis Fukuyama was up here and gave a talk, which is, his talk is in the collection. I'll, I'll, where's Michael? Uh, I'll plug the book that Michael's helping to co edit, which is a collection of papers from that conference, but in which Fukuyama called out Jean Beth Elstein uh, for her lack of real attentiveness to economic questions uh, in her communitarian thinking. And it was really, it actually, I think, if you remember this, it provoked what became the major theme of the entire rest of the conference, which was is there a place for this kind of thinking and, and critique, and has this been a blind spot in that sort of 1980s communitarian thinking? I think, I think it is, and I think it reflects uh, um, wh where I ended up kind of thinking about this debate, and it was during the time of my own intellectual formation, which is that it seems that um, communi communitarianism, so-called, so thinkers like Michael Sandel and Jean Beth Elstein um, and others, wanted ultimately to sort of make liberalism more community friendly. Uh, it wasn't really a critique of liberalism per se. And I would say that liberalism kind of, or those who were proponents of liberalism wanted to say, kind of went halfway and tried to meet them, which is to say, yes, we, we care about community and good things like that. And it, and it seems to me it was a very unsatisfactory conclusion because that long debate, volumes and volumes uh, written about it, was really uh, all within the frame of the basic uh, liberal framework that I've been describing. And I suppose, if anything, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to argue with that debate, uh, in part because I don't think it was sufficiently radical, getting to the root of things. And so part of, part of what I've been trying to think about is the is precisely the, I think, what is the very valuable Marxist analysis of the, of the relationship of the state and the market. And I, I'm a big fan of Marx in his diagnosis. And those of you who think I you know, might be conservative or capitalists uh, who are worried about me right now, or Catholics, uh, read the first five pages of the Communist Manifesto and tell me that that's not right on. All that is solid melts into air, right? Capital will be the, uh, cheap prices will be the cannons that will knock down the wall of China, right? That, um, that it's the global international market will be the thing that will eviscerate, you know, particular kinds of 
local forms and practices. Now Marx goes on then to say, and isn't this great too, because now we can create this world global system, workers of the world unite, and we can create this cosmopolitan order in which eventually the state and the market will wither away. Now this is where I part with Marx. I don't want either of those things to wither away. And this is where, I suppose here again, Chesterton and Belloc are helpful to me, which is that in, in a, some ways a political order needs to, a good political order needs to order a good market in which citizens um, are able to own property, have a stake. I'm not Marxist because I think there should be property. Um, but uh, also in which, um, to, to invoke Aristotle, um, no society can maintain its legitimacy if it's based on profound economic stratification and, and, and accelerating economic stratification. And I, I would say that to the extent that we see liberalism in crisis, it's partly economic, but I think it's also the sense that we lack the political power to do anything about this. We are effectively living in an oligarchy. We're not a democracy or a republic. So I, 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 I'm grateful for your question because I do think it's my own intellectual formation um, left me very unsatisfied with the conclusion of this debate. And so in a way I'm hoping to re-spark it, uh, re -spark it in some ways, but I'm also hoping I can change some of the terms of the debate. And that sounded really hubristic, but, uh, um, but to be a little workman in that, in that effort. So I think we're up against the hour, so uh, thank you. I appreciate it.